given that uh, you sort of identify uh, as a Marxist, I thought you might have an interesting perspective on the uh, Russia-Ukraine situation happening right now, and I thought that might lead us into some of the other issues that we'll address. So what is the economic context uh, going on here with the Ukraine-Russia situation, and, uh, and what is America's relationship to that situation? Well, to talk about that is to engage in an awful lot of history. Uh, the Ukraine is in a part of uh, that part of the world that is basically Russia's um, outlet to the Mediterranean and to shipping around the world. Um, the Crimean Peninsula, that particular part of the Ukraine, as well as some of the areas around it, have been an integral part of the Russian slash Soviet economy uh, for a long, long time, and so it's it's thoroughly integrated. Um, it is not surprising to anyone who isn't lost in ideology that the Soviet Union and now Russia uh, would not allow, if they could stop it, any kind of development in that part of the world that would threaten their uh, basic economic uh, interests. It just uh, no country would do that, and uh, they're not going to do it. The rest is, is lots of posturing. Um, yes, they had an awful government. Many countries around the world have awful governments. Uh, the United States deals with most of them. Uh, when it isn't propping them up, it's certainly interacting with them. And so that's not an argument. And yes, there was some popular anger and resentment against this awful government, and that was expressed in all of this. Uh, and that's part of the story, but it's not really the major part of the story. The question is whether something as crucial in the way of a small country uh, virtually integrated with a neighboring huge country, uh, whether that kind of society is going to be allowed in our modern political world uh, to break away, uh, to go in another direction, one which is threatening to the large country next door. I mean, it, it doesn't happen in our uh, world, and I don't say that's a good thing. I don't support it. I don't endorse it. But to raise up our hands in shocked amazement that another country uh, like Russia would do that in terms of a small neighboring country is uh, hypocritical and disingenuous, to say the least. I mean, especially for a country that just went halfway around the world to two small countries <laughs> that couldn't possibly, by any reasonable stretch of the imagination, have been considered threats to the United States economically or any other way, namely Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, so to, to, for this country that invaded those countries with either no or false pretexts uh, to express shock and dismay when Russia does it is, is it's, uh, if it weren't tragic in terms of loss of life, it would be laughable as a, a political construct. We live in a world, unfortunately, uh, that is overwhelmingly capitalist. The economies of the United States and Russia today are capitalist mm -hmm. by the announcement of both of them. And that, those kinds of capitalist countries do not look kindly on threats to their profitability, to their big industries, and so on. And uh, that's more likely the explanation of Iraq and Afghanistan on the one hand, and now the Ukraine on the other, uh, than anything else. Uh, so, Professor, am I wrong to potentially read into this situation uh, a sort of a clash of economic systems uh, between East and West? I'm wondering if Russia isn't pushing back a little bit on the sort of hegemonic powers of the West, uh, particularly because you see that, you know, for example, and again, I might not be understanding the finer points of this, but when they offered, uh, when Russia was offering Ukraine, U Ukraine the $15 billion of an interest-free loan 
versus now they're going to have to be going to the IMF and be forced to enact severe austerity on their country. Um, if that doesn't benefit maybe some of the w wealthier ruling business capitalists of the of the society. Well, again, I, I would appeal to history to give you the context um, of what is going on. The, the basic issue here is that capitalist economies clash. There's nothing about capitalism over the last 200 years that has spread from England to become the global dominant economic system. There's nothing about that process that uh, was peaceful. Uh, capitalist countries clashed and produced World War I 100 years ago, the worst calamity probably that any, uh, of any era in human history. A few short years later, uh, Germany, Britain, the United States, France, Italy, Japan, also capitalist economic systems, went to war and had World War II. Uh, it, capitalism has been uh, synonymous with unspeakable military conflict among competing capitalist countries. And I'm not surprised that the uh, capitalist economy, which it proudly proclaims is what it is in Russia today, and the capitalist economy, which proudly proclaims what it is today in the Ukraine and in Western Europe and in the United States, find themselves yet again in a situation where their economic interests coincide enough with their political policies uh, to produce the risk of real war, killing large numbers of people uh, whose interests have nothing or very little to do with what these large enterprises that are driving all of this, Russia with its need to export its uh, minerals and its fuels and its gas and all the rest, and the Ukraine, which is a dependent kind of society trying to figure out how to develop itself with its corporations, that they end up in a warlike configuration is unfortunately part of what this economic system uh, has spawned wherever it has developed. Whatever the advance <laughs> capitalism made over what existed before, feudalism and so on, peace and peaceful resolution of conflict is not among their achievements, to say the least. And, and for me, therefore, this is best understood as yet another situation in which conflicting and competing interests, part of the Ukraine uh, has business interests who see more money to be made, more advantageous arrangements to be worked out with Western Europe, and don't want Russia uh, to interfere with those plans. Other parts of the Ukraine have exactly the reverse orientation. This produces enormous conflict. If you pay attention, you'll see that much of what's going on is a conflict between eastern Ukraine and western Ukraine. Uh, these are the conflicts inside of that. And as they blew, blew up in an undemocratic society, both Europe and the United States on the one hand who would like to see the Ukraine move more in their direction, and the Russians, on the other hand, who would like to see the development be more favorable to them, uh, don't see eye to eye. And since the Russians are right there and have their troops right on the border and have long-standing uh, knowledge of every detail of the terrain of Ukraine since it was part of the Soviet Union, uh, that they moved in this situation is, as I say, for those who follow this, no surprise, no stunner, no shocker, um, but literally part of the playbook you would expect. Uh, so, Professor Wolf, the New York Times Magazine has described you as America's most prominent Marxist economist. Um, assuming you're okay with that label, I think it's safe to say that there are a large number of Americans who get a little squeamish at the idea of Marxism and have all sorts of negative associations with that, the, that term and with communism and socialism. I'm wondering if, to sort of put them at ease, maybe you could describe the difference between capitalism, state capitalism, and socialism. Sure. Uh, let me first assure you and your listeners that uh, the New York Times is given to doing what the press normally does, 
which is hype things uh, a good bit in order, I guess, to make them more interesting or to attract audiences or whatever their motivations are. The truth of the matter is that I have always found uh, that what comes out of the Marxist tradition of thought is a pretty heady mixture of all kinds of writings. I mean, Marxism is now a, a point of view, if you like, a tradition of thought that exists in every country on the face of the earth. It has grown extraordinarily over the last 150 years uh, since Marx wrote his, his materials. Um, an enormous array of different cultures and, and intellects and experiences are woven into that tradition. And it is part of what the human community has produced. Uh, there should be nothing scary at all about it. And if we weren't, you know, coming out of the Cold War for 40 years, Americans wouldn't think of it that way. Marxism is basically the critique of capitalism. Like every other system, feudalism, slavery, every other economic system, capitalism has produced people who love it and people who don't like it. Uh, its supporters and celebrants on the one hand and its critics on the other. The most developed, articulate, and, de and uh, sophisticated of all the critiques of capitalism, and there are many, uh, is Marxism. And it has attracted more people for whatever complicated reason and produced a much larger and richer body of critical analysis uh, than the other critics. But Marxism is a product of capitalism. It is, if you like, the criticism. Uh, the metaphor I use when I teach to my students is that, you know, capitalism will get rid of Marxism about as soon as we get rid of our shadow. It's part of us. It's the, our relationship to the source of light. We depend on the light, but the light also produces a, sh a shadow. Marxism is the critical, the self-criticism, if you like, uh, of capitalism. And I, I remind people that so long as capitalism is growing and thriving and existing, you can be sure that there will be Marxism because that's the major cause of Marxism, capitalism, because that's what Marxism is focused on. Having said that, uh, I also find it bizarre that people get uh, squeamish and all, all the rest, as you correctly say. I understand, of course, what you're saying. Um, but, again, a metaphor to get the idea across. If you wanted to understand the family that lives down the street from you, and you were serious. You wanted to understand that family. And you looked into it, and there was a mother and a father and two kids. And one of the kids thought this family was the greatest family in the world, felt lucky to be a child in that family, and had that point of view. Whereas the other child said, no, this is a dysfunctional family. It's all screwed up, and it has family in various ways. If you wanted to understand that family, would you talk only to one of the two children? Or would you think it reasonable for you to talk with both the, the child who loves it and the child who's critical of it, and then make up your own mind depending on what they say and how they respond to your questions and all the rest of your evaluations uh, as you make them? For me, if I want to understand capitalism, I think a reasonable person would say, I would certainly want to hear what the people think who love it and celebrate it, but I would also like to listen to those who are critical of it, and then I'll make up my own mind, thank you very much. But I don't need and I don't like to be told that I am not to listen to the critic, only to the celebrants, only to those who have one point of view but not the other one, and to... Uh, exclude all those who speak in a critical voice, which is what we have largely done in the United States by demonizing that perspective. All that that really accomplishes is it denies to most Americans all of the insights and understandings that critics are able to bring to bear. doesn't mean that when you look at or listen to or read a Marxist work that you have to agree with it. That's not the point. The point is that it should be part of an adult, serious conversation where we juxtapose, we compare one perspective with another in order to form the best judgment uh, that we can. So yes, I have always felt that way, so I have been making sure I understand and I keep up with 
uh, the Marxist tradition of thought, because it seems to me, as an economist who's often called upon to analyze uh, capitalism, it would be the height of intellectual dishonesty and irresponsibility for me to ignore uh, a tradition as important as that, the major critical tradition, a tradition that has important thinkers in every country on earth, that seems to me a little bit like the ostrich sticking his head in the ground for fear of what it might learn if it looked around. Um, I, I think also people might be somewhat assuaged if you were to talk a little bit about the relationship between democracy and socialism and the potential sort of contradiction in terms uh, to, say, say a democratic capitalism. Exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah, so maybe talk a little bit about that and also maybe explain again the, the state capitalist system that was Russia and how that equates to what we're talking about now. Good. Um, capitalism, for me, is a system, and, and let me back up and make sure that, that folks understand. I've been a professor of economics uh, all my adult life, born and raised in the United States and teaching throughout my life in, in U.S., uh, institutions. Uh, I went to school at Harvard as an undergraduate. I got my master's in economics at Stanford University in California and my PhD in economics at Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut. So by the normal standards of the United States, I'm a bit of a poster boy for elite education. And everything I learned about capitalism in all those institutions and that I have studied all the rest of my life since uh, has led me to basically understand uh, the following. The capitalist system is distinguished by, above all, the way that it organizes the production of goods and services. We all depend on that, on food, clothing, shelter. We depend on the goods and services produced in what we call our economic system. And capitalism organizes that system in a very particular way. It has a majority of people, workers, who come to work five days a week, typically, nine to five, who use their brains and their muscles. They work on equipment uh, that is provided by their employer. They work on raw materials that are provided by their employer according to a plan determined by their employer. Uh, what they produce is to determined by the employer. How they produce it, the technology, is determined by the employer. Where they do the work is determined by the employer. And perhaps most of them, important of all, the profits generated by the work uh, are the property of the employer who uses them and distributes them as he sees fit. For me, that's a capitalist system. And it is fundamentally uh, what we typically call capitalism, and it remains, in my view, capitalism, whether the employer is a private enterprise owned and operated by individuals who are not part of the state, and we call that private capitalism, or it can be state capitalism. That is, the state can become the employer. In the Soviet Union, for example, the state took over the industries of, of uh, Russia, and operated those as state-owned and operated enterprises. The state itself determined who would be the board of directors, the, the people who actually make the decisions, what to produce, how to produce, where to produce, and what to do with the profits. And in Russia, those were state officials. In the private capitalism of the United States, for example, the state does not play that role. Instead, the shareholders, the people who own the shares, are the ones who decide who's on the board of directors, who makes all the key decisions. But shares are not held widely in the United States. That is, roughly 1% of the shareholders own 75% of the shares in the United States. So in the end, when you understand how the system works, a tiny, a tiny minority of Americans are the major shareholders in all of our big corporations, and that tiny group of major shareholders selects the board of directors in all the major corporations, those 15 to 20 people that sit at the top of every major corporation and who make all the decisions. 
Now, before I talk about socialism, I want to drive home a point. Private capitalism and state capitalism. The United States as an example of the private, the Soviet Union or China as an example of the state capitalism, remain capitalist. Why? Because the majority of the people doing the work are excluded from the ongoing decisions, what to produce, how to produce, where to produce, and what to do with the profits. And that, for me, is crucial. It is also the case, then, that both private capitalism and state capitalism are fundamentally undemocratic. That is, they do not operate under the following principle, that those who make the decisions should be the people who have to live with the results. Clearly, a worker, whether that worker be in a private capitalism in the U.S., or in a state capitalism of the sort that existed in the Soviet Union. That worker is not making the decisions upon which his or her life depends. They don't decide, for example, whether the factory closes down and moves to China. They don't decide, for example, whether the technology that they've been using is thrown out and a new one is brought in. They do not participate in deciding how to use and dispose of the profits that their own labor helps to produce. They are excluded from those decisions, even though their lives in many ways depend on them. So that a corporation, whether it's in private capitalism in the U.S. or a state enterprise in the Soviet Union or the People's Republic of China, is equally undemocratic and that has to be faced by Americans, even though uh, we make a fetish in our country of not facing that reality. In order for enterprises to be uh, democratic, something which I find to be an enormously important and desirable goal, in order for them to be democratic, they would have to be run by the workers within them. That is, all the workers, from the guy who sweeps the floor to the woman who operates the computer, to the man who works on the machine, to the woman who directs the, the flow of goods and services inside the office, whatever they are. They would all participate democratically, equally, in together making the decisions, what to produce, how to produce, where to produce, and what to do with the profits. For me, and I take this from the Marxian tradition, the real alternative to capitalism is an economic system in which production is organized in this cooperative way. Whether you want to call these enterprises worker co-ops, or you want to call them workers self-directed enterprises, where the idea is that the worker is never only the producer, the laborer, but is always also uh, an equal part of a democratic governance of the enterprise. Whatever name you give to it, that's the alternative to capitalism that I get out of the Marxian tradition, and which I happen to think is the best available solution to the kind of quandary that capitalism has now put the entire world in. I, I want to underscore, we remain in a serious economic crisis that we had been told we would never see again after the lessons we supposedly learned from the Great Depression. Here we are instead, ever since 2007, with the second worst economic downturn in the history of capitalism. And since it's not over yet, it still is in the running to become the worst. I hope that doesn't happen. But if you ask me, is it possible, the answer is an unqualified yes. We still have millions of our people without jobs, millions of people thrown out of their homes with foreclosure. This is a capitalism that is not delivering the goods to the majority of people, and I think that's the fundamental reason why more and more folks, myself among them, are saying it's long overdue for us to look at alternatives uh, to capitalism, to both private and state capitalism, uh, not only because they have much to offer, but because the system we're living under is offering us less and less and less.